Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you again today. A beautiful day uh, outside. Uh, winter's here now. It's coming. We're in the book of Revelation moving towards the end. We have today and two more times together as we look here at the book of Revelation. It's exciting as we just consider heaven. I'm, I'm so excited just to think about what heaven's going to be like. And I know you are too. It's, everyone who lives has some sense of thinking, uh, wondering, what is it going to be like after, after I'm not here any longer? We talked about that last week. Many have such a wide uh, view of what heaven is all about. The Word of God is very clear in showing us the promise of heaven and gives us just enough of a glimpse and of a taste to show us the, the certainty, the assurance of what we have in Christ, what heaven will be like. It doesn't answer all of our questions. It doesn't answer most of our questions. But it answers the essential ones, and it gives us the hope that we need in Christ. Uh, to just live today, to be faithful to Christ today, to have joy in the Lord, and just to walk through each day and say, uh, and just know that one day we're going to be with the Lord. And so it's just that glimpse of, of just excitement as we're here in Revelation. We've gone through, we've seen Revelation is about Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And now Jesus Christ is, is, is fulfilling all of God's word and giving us ultimately the final promise of his Father that is bringing us home to a place prepared for us for all eternity. And so we're just encountering the reality of heaven. And we, and we encounter this phrase in chapter 21, verse 1, and then John writes, And then I saw, and it's a contrast to everything that has happened up to this point, and, and now, now eternity is, is in view, and everything changes. And so that's what we saw last time we were together here in the book of Revelation. We saw history's greatest contrast. That's the contrast between the great white throne... The judgment, eternal judgment of unbelievers and the gift of eternal life and the presence of, of God in heaven for all eternity. The contrast is, is the greatest of any contrast you could possibly make in this world and in this life. Believer and unbeliever. And, and, and what did he see? He sees everything. Everything now is made brand new. Heaven and earth remade, fashioned by God himself. We now see the dwelling place of God. That's what John shows us. We see, we see everything made right. No more sorrow and no more tears and no more suffering and no more mourning and no more crying. None of those things. And, and every promise of God is now fulfilled. That's what we have seen. And then we see a, a clear-cut choice. Christ now receive him as Savior or reject the promise and the provision and the truth that he gives to me. I want to continue this thought, because when John opens up this chapter, he says, and, and then I saw, let me show you, let me show you all the wonderful things that God has shown to me and revealed to me. And so now we continue this this morning as we uh, are in chapter 21. And so let's move to verse 9, and we see the seventh thing. We're going to just continue in order here. Let's pick it up in chapter 21 verse 9, and we're just going to read a section here and pick up the Word of God, and then we'll go from there. And then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in a spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God and having the glory of God. It's radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates, and on the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. On the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were, were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. What we see here in these verses is, and then I saw the presentation of the bride. That's what we see here. Verse, verse 9, we see, we see the very first thing is we see a plague turned to blessing. The very angel that was involved in, in the seven bowls of wrath is now, is now one of those angels is involved and in now in showing us the greatest blessing of Oh, one of those seven angels now shows us, and I'm going to show you the best thing, the most awesome thing. 
Come, I want to show you the bride, the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And so that's what we see. We see the city, and it's, it's tied directly to the city of Jerusalem. We see that here in verse, in verse 10 and 11. I'm going to show you the bride. I'm going to show you the wife of the Lamb. And so he takes me, and he shows me in verse 10. He shows me the new Jerusalem. He carries me away in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit. He carries me away, and he shows me what I could, what I could never see otherwise. I'd never have the opportunity to glimpse this. No man has had the opportunity to glimpse this except by the very privileged revelation of God into their life. And he carried me away, and he showed me a great high mountain, and he shows me Jerusalem coming down. And Jerusalem is identified and associated with, directly, the bride of Christ. I want to show you the bride of Christ. And, 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 the, and the city and the bride are now as one, as it were. The, 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 the glory of, of the city is the glory of the bride. The glory of the bride is the glory of the city. The city is, is adorned, we've already seen, as, as a bride. And, and they come down together, and the bride is all is now all of the people. We are the church is the bride of Christ, but now now all believers are united in one, and we are together as one, the bride of Christ. Uh, not just the church, but all redeemed believers, all who have ever put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We are now together, the bride of Jesus Christ. Those walls have been completely broken down between Jew and Gentile. Um, and God has now made us one. And we are we are now presented fully. You know, that's that's you know, in the in the in the in the culture of the Jewish wedding, that last piece was to present the bride. We've seen we've seen various ways in which the bride has been presented already in Revelation. This is the final, the ultimate, the eternal. Uh, God is God is showing off his handiwork of grace in our life. He's showing off his his handiwork of generosity to a redeemed people. By giving us a city that is filled with what we're about to see, it is a beautiful thing. And in in verse ten, in verse ten, we see this. It is immersed in holiness. Jerusalem is is coming down from God. It was in the in the heavens of heavens with God during the millennial kingdom. Probably, most likely, maybe the the uh, the church was here. And, and probably going back and forth and, and, and involved in serving during the millennial kingdom. And, and now this, this new heaven and new earth is shared with all of the redeemed. And it's come down, it comes down from God. And we see in verse, verse uh, 10, it is a holy city. It is filled with, uh, with absolute holiness of God. You know, whenever we look at Scripture and we see the holiness of God, it's a fearful thing. It, it Anytime we see Isaiah or Paul or John or anyone before the glory, the holiness of God, there is, there is, there is a, a fear, there is the recognition that I'm a sinner in the presence of a holy God. Uh, the, the people in Mount Sinai in the Old Testament in terror before the holy God at Mount Sinai. But what we see here is completely different. We saw this last week. Now holy, holiness permeates everything and we are also holy as well. Um, and so we are at home. In the, in the presence of the holiness of God. We see in verse 11, it is also, it, it is immersed in the very glory of God. You know, every day we live all to the glory of God, doing everything in our life, whether we eat or drink or whatever we do, we're to, we're to do it so that God is glorified. Now we're, now we're living in the very presence of the absolute glory of God. The new Jerusalem, the holy city, the bride of Christ is immersed in and experiencing fully the glory of God and not, and not, we don't die because of that exposure. We, we are able to be as one in the presence of God because we're going to see why because of the transformation, the work that's been done in our life by Christ. It is, it is a beautiful thing. In verse twelve and thirteen, we see this. It has, it has a great high wall, um, all the way around the city. That's what we see here. Uh, those. And the, and the walls have have twelve gates. Uh, there's there's three on each side. Uh, the gates are inscribed with the twelve names of Israel, the twelve tribes of Israel, and and we see the foundations here of the city in verse fourteen. Uh, they are named after the twelve apostles. You could debate till the end because it doesn't tell us is Paul the twelfth apostle? Is, is Matthew that twelfth apostle from Acts? We don't know because ultimately it doesn't tell us. I'd probably lean towards Paul, but you know what? 
The Bible doesn't, with finality, necessarily answer that question. But there are clues. But the, here's the reality. You have, you have the city clearly representing every Old Testament believer. Israel herself represented in, in the gates that, that are the entrance to the holy city. You have the foundation in verse 14. It's interesting that this foundation in verse 14, you can see the foundation. Usually you hide the foundation. When you look at any buildings that are built, it's extremely rare to, to be able to see founda the foundation that's been exposed. It's always underground. Here the foundation is exposed. It is beautiful. It is a part of the beauty of the city. It is built on the foundation of the ministry of Christ to the New Testament church, the 12 apostles. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. What we see here in these verses is, again, the beauty of God uniting all the redeemed from all of history, Old Testament, New Testament, together as one. Uh, I love it. And so we see the presentation of the bride, which is, which is united with the presentation of this new Jerusalem, the home, the dwelling place of God, of God's people. We are now united together as one. And then we pick it up and we move further in verse 15. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. And the city lies four square, its length the same as its width. And he measured the city with his, his rod, 12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall. 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. That's interesting, isn't it? The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned. Here's the foundations with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh uh, chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. The street of the city was pure gold, and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut. There will, no be, uh, there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Here we see, and then I saw, James says, uh, John says, and then I saw the presence of God. That's what we see here in, in this section here. We see the city. We see the city itself in verse 15 and 16. It's cubed. It's, it, is, uh, it, it, it just shows us the perfection of God. 12,000 stadia, most recognized that is 1,500 miles. So it's 1,500 miles wide. It's 1,500 miles long. It's 1,500 miles Hall. It is mammoth beyond, beyond measure, larger than any dwelling place that has ever been created in all of history. God is creating something, has created something beyond measure. And I, and I love this. Uh, one of my favorite artists was Keith Green, and he's, he says, you know what? God created this world in six days. He's been working on heaven for 2,000 years. We must be living in a garbage dump. Think about God's handiwork being done and his care being given to to what ultimately will be our eternal dwelling place god with great care with grace with love with compassion uh, with promise is giving to us his very best for all eternity it is a beautiful thing 1500 miles wide city coming down out of heaven um massive beyond measure the walls are 144 cubits uh, most most understand a uh, cubits actually vary uh, quite a bit uh, in inches. Most understand a cubit probably generally to be 18 inches long. It can be shorter. It can be longer. It's usually the length of the elbow to the arm. Um, that's that's the standard. And of course our arms vary, but it, so 18 inches is a standard. That'd be 216 feet. The walls would be 216 feet uh, tall. 
which some say, well, that's not very tall for the immensity of the city. Maybe it's 216 feet wide. At any rate, at any rate it's, it's beautiful beyond uh, measure. Chapter, in verses 18 uh, uh, to 21, we, see, we just see the description of, of the beauty of the city, all different kinds, the very best of precious stones and, and gems. And, and over and over again, we see as you look underneath the meaning of some of these jewels, the gold is, is pure like crystal and the jasper is, is clear and the walls are clear. And it's just a, you see the purity of God's very best in, his, in, his, in how, what he's built heaven with. And God's glory is able to radiate through the city uh, and shine and, and just resonate with all the colors that are coming off of these jewels. Some of these jewels have different names and different generations and different cultures. So it's, it's hard to, to, to specify some of these. But you know what? When we get there, we're going to be amazed beyond measure. Um, and so you have you have this city that is that is beyond description. It's it it's it's the most glorious city that has ever been built. You go to you go to any destination that you would love to go to and go to and just see the very best that that city has to offer. It will pale in comparison to what heaven is all about. Uh, each gate, a single pearl, that's even beyond the scope of imagination. But with God, nothing's impossible. Um, it is a beautiful thing. How, how can we even begin to, to put our mind's eye around what's being described here until we actually see it? The streets, gold, but they're transparent gold. It's just, folks, it's, it's amazing. God is there in verse 22. God is present. There's no temple. It's not needed. Because God is the temple, there's no need to go to church. There's no need to go to synagogue. There's no need to go somewhere and worship. Every fiber, every breath of our life in heaven will, will be an expression of worship because we are in the very presence of God. When we're in heaven, we will, we will express with our every breath just our love and affection for God. It doesn't mean we're just going to stand there and do this all the time because we see... We see um, we will serve Him. We will worship Him. We will work for Him. We will labor for Him. It'll be a joy. It'll be a delight. Um, we see in verse 23, there'll be no, no need for a moon, for the sun. God is the light in heaven. All of heaven, all of earth will be lit by the glory of God. Um, that is an amazing thing. It's real. Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, when God created the heavens and the earth and the stars and the universe and all those things that he gave to us. He created it, he created it for signs and for seasons for man. He created it to give light on the earth. It was man-centered. It was for the sake of man. Now man, redeemed man, we are in the very presence of God, his glory. We will not need these things. It will be the glory of God. It will be our light. We will never be in the dark. Amazing. The nations, verse 24. The nations, they will, uh, they will bring their glory. The nations, uh, by its, its light, the nations will walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. The gates will never be shut. The gates will always be open. There are angels at each gate. There is no threat from any direction. There will never be for eternity ever a threat to anything that is the reality of what heaven is all about. And the nations will bring their glory into it. That's a, de that's a debated verse. What, is it, what does it mean? Well, it's hard to know what it means, but I know what it doesn't mean. It's clear to know what it does not mean. In Revelation, when you see the nations, often it's associated with the unbeliever, with the pagan nations, with the nations that turn against God in the tribulation. But you also see, and let's look at this, you also see very clearly in chapter 5 here, Revelation, uh, you see this description and you see it more than just here. Worthy are you, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, to take the scroll and to open its seal. For you were slain by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. The description here of the nations bringing their glory into heaven is clearly a description of the redeemed. Clearly a description of those who are in relationship to Jesus Christ. They're bringing their glory into heaven. What does that mean? They're bringing their, their riches, their wealth as they work in, on this earth for Christ, as they serve Him. Um, 
It's possible. There's a thought that's possible. I would never be dogmatic on this because the Bible is 100% silent. The Bible does not talk about those who are saved during the millennial kingdom and maybe don't die because they survived the millennial kingdom. What happens to them? Of course, they're going to be in the presence of God for all eternity. Do they live on the earth and, and come regularly and continually into heaven and bring their, bring their glory in? They might not be it at all. It might be it, I don't know. Will we be going out continually and bringing back the fruit of our labor for Christ, whatever that labor is? But here's the reality. They will bring their glory into the nations. It is believers for sure. We know that. But here's the key. When we bring that glory in, whatever that is, our glory is then swallowed up in the glory of the Lord. Whatever we bring to the Lord is offered to him continually as worship. It is never about us. These nations who are bringing in whatever they bring in to heaven, whatever they bring in is for the glory for the sake of the Lord. It is not about them. If, they are, if it is a reflection of reward that God promises to all of us, then those rewards will continually be cast at his feet. We will continually be bringing it to him in worship. And the glory will always be his. So I see no contradiction here. We don't have all the answers to what that verse is. But it's clearly that there, is, there are nations which are the redeemed bringing glory in to heaven. It is, uh, is it us going out and coming back? Is it those who came through the millennium and now are, we don't know. But whatever it is, God is continually receiving the glory that is being brought in. That is, that is the thing I want you to hold on to and to be sure of. Um, it is only redeemed. Verse 27 makes that absolutely clear to us. Nothing unclean will ever enter heaven. Verse 27 makes it clear that no unbeliever ever will be able to enter heaven, for they are in the lake of fire. Satan and all of his angels are in the lake of fire. They can never, ever, ever leave that domain, that place of punishment. They can never come towards, to, or approach the domain of the redeemed. That is the beauty of it. Heaven is beyond description. Then we pick it up in chapter 22, verses 1 through 5. And then the angel showed me. He showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, and on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light. They will reign forever and ever. God's promise to us. And so we see this. We see here the very pres the provision of God's of life. The provision of life. The river of life. The tree of life. God provides life for all eternity. That's what he promised. That's what he fulfills. That's what we see here as it unfolds. We see in, the, in these first two verses, we see the river of life. Again, it's it's it's. It's bright as crystal. Um, we just see the clarity of the purity of the holiness that everything God shows. And then the, and the beauty of the colors of the, across the spectrum that God has ever created is, is shining through heaven in so many facets, in so many ways. Uh, here, we see, here we see the river coming from the throne of God. Um, the throne of God is its source. God is his source. It is coming through the middle of the city. It is in the middle of this vast 1,500 mile wide, long, tall city is the, is the river of life flowing from the very throne of God. Uh, what that looks like, we can only imagine from what we see here. Ezekiel gives us a picture. We have a millennial picture here. Remember chapters 40 to 47, Ezekiel's giving us a picture of the millennium, not eternity. We have here, we have the, uh, the water of God flowing from the temple of God, not the throne of God. We see a distinction here uh, in that. And so, and so we, you know, what we see here is ultimately the, the, the fulfillment of the picture of God's promise when Jesus said to the woman at the well, I am, the, I am the living water. I am the water of life. If you would drink this water, if you knew who was offering to you this water, 
and she would receive Christ. And we are ultimately receiving the benefit of this eternal, life-giving water from Jesus Christ, the water of life, relationship with Him, this water coming through um, the heavens through the New Jerusalem. What a beautiful thing that we see here. We see that we see the tree of life as well. In verse 2, we have the river of life, we have the tree of life. Um, the tree of life, it's singular. There's one tree of life. It seems to be in the text. There's one tree of life. It's the tree of life. It, it, takes us, it takes us back to Genesis. It reminds us of the tree of life there in Genesis. Adam and Eve had access to, not the, not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They ate of that one. They shouldn't have. They sinned against God. Um, we, have a, we have a tree. It seems, to, it seems to be from the Greek and from the text, a singular tree. And yet it spans both sides of the river. Uh, it is God can do that, right? It, it, it's it's a it's an amazing thing. It has twelve kinds of fruit. It yields its fruit every month. There's there's still the sense of there's no moon, there's no sun, uh, and it seems from what we see. Uh, but yeah, there's still some sense of time even through all of eternity because every month a new fruit comes out. You know, tree fruit trees only give fruit for just a short span each year. This tree will continually give new fruit, beautiful fruit, every month, a different kind of fruit from the same tree. Variety, beauty, it will taste good. We will eat. Jesus Christ ate after he rose from the dead. We're going to eat in heaven. We don't have to eat. We don't. Jesus didn't have to eat to survive. He ate because he chose to eat. We will be able to eat. We won't have to. We will enjoy the delicacies of God. But we won't have to have three meals a day or whatever. Our bodies, our incorruptible bodies, will not need that same kind of sustenance because our life will be in Christ, not our food. Uh, and yet God will still give us the privilege of eating and enjoying this fruit, which will be the best thing in the world. Just know that God will, if you don't like fruit, God will change your taste buds. <laughs> and the food that God offers in heaven will be the best that you ever had. Anyways, this tree of life, again, is the source. It shows us the life that we have in Christ. The river of life, this tree of life. In Ezekiel, again, we see this. We see also the, this water coming out of the temple, not the throne. We see all kinds of trees, not a singular tree. We see, we see uh, distinctions that are close together, but yet are distinct. And so we see that between Ezekiel and this eternal heaven. I just want to show you that as well. It's important to see. We have the leaves here. They are for healing. The word, the, the, the word therapy comes out of that Greek word that's used there. It doesn't mean that, that there is still sickness and disease. Remember all of those things. The curse, the curses that God placed on humanity because of sin have all 100% been lifted. There is no disease. There is no sickness. There is no sorrow. There are no stubbed toes. There are no scratches. There are no falls. There is nothing that will happen in heaven like happens on here on earth. The healing, I believe, is that therapy, therapeutic element. It is enriching. The leaves continually enrich us in some way. What, do we, what does that mean? Does it mean that we actually touch their leaves? We pick the leaves? Does it mean... That when, when rain comes up and it can, descends, it comes down, and the, and the leaves pick that up, and the leaves produce oxygen, is it just simply mean that that tree of life is indeed what? Our very life, the essence of life through Christ, through God himself? Um, we don't have all those answers, but it, it doesn't mean, it cannot mean, because of what Scripture has already shown us, that the healing means that we're going to get sick and need to be healed. It simply is for the enrichment of life, the, the therapeutic uh, blessing of, of God's blessing to us continually, 24-7, all the time. And that tree of life will somehow be, will be systemic and systematic and essential to all of that, to all of us. Um, it is God's faithful provision to you and to I. That's what I want you to see. That's what you want, want you to understand. Verse 3, again, there is no curse of any kind. Uh, there will be nothing accursed. There will be nothing bad in heaven. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Whatever is bad in your life right now, no matter what age you are at, 
It will never not exist in heaven. The bad will not exist in heaven. No sickness, no evil, no sin, no temptation, nothing bad will be in heaven. You need to know that. It will be perfect in every way and continue to be perfect for all eternity. That's what God gave Adam and Eve in the beginning. And then they made a choice to sin. Now we, our only choice will be to love Him because that will be our very nature. We will have been transformed by Jesus Christ. Our nature will be His. We will long to be with Him. No curse. Why? Because God's there. His presence is there. His holiness, His glory is there. That's the key. We will worship Him. We see here in verse verse 3, we will worship Him. We will serve Him. Our every breath will be for Him. Our, ver our every satisfaction, our great joy every day. It'll be a leisure service. It'll be a It'll be a service that is fulfilling and meaningful, and it will not be tedious. It will not be labor. We won't be bored in heaven. We'll not be unfulfilled in heaven. We'll not be wishing we could be doing this or doing that. We'll not be longing for something else. We will be completely satisfied. You need to know that's true. You know, we try to explain heaven to each other. We try to explain it to teens. We try to explain it to adults. We try to explain it to one. What's it mean? What we're going to do? I don't want to be bored in heaven. Folks, we're not going to be bored in heaven. God has promised to satisfy us for all eternity. We will be satisfied in everything that we do. It'll be the greatest existence you and I will have ever known. We'll never get tired of heaven. We will want more of heaven with every, with every moment, with every passing moment, with every breath. Verse 4 tells us, and we will, we, will, uh, we will see His face, and His name will be on our foreheads, their foreheads. Here we have the reality of seeing the very presence of God, seeing God face to face. Here in Exodus, we have this glimpse. God said to Moses, you cannot, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. God, man cannot see God face to face and live. God makes that clear. He showed, he showed Moses a glimpse of his glory. He did not show Moses his face. It says Moses spoke to him face to face, but that's a word picture for intimacy. It's not, it's not a literal, and the context shows us that clearly. It's not a literal, did Moses saw his face literally. No, what he had was intimacy with God, not, not the ability to see God's face. That is forbidden from Scripture. We see here in 1 Timothy, Christ, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light. Now he does. He's in unapproachable light. He's in the glory of God. God, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and, and eternal dominion. He is in the unapproachable light, the glory of God, which no one has ever seen or can see. That's what we see in the scriptures. That's the reality. 1 John 3. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet appeared. Our ability, our privilege hasn't been fulfilled yet. But we know that when Jesus Christ appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Not only Christ, but because we are like Christ then, we will be able to see God as well. We will see him face to face. Why? Because there will be no sin. We will be holy as he is holy. We will be holy as he is holy. We will be sinless as he is sinless. Our nature will be his nature. We will never be God, but we will have his nature. We will have his disposition. We will have his character. It will permeate all that we are, we will have been transformed new creatures in Jesus Christ. We will be able to see God dwell with Him forever. I just want you to know that. I want you to understand that. It is so important that we see that, that we understand that. God will reverse this prohibition and, and unlock our ability to be in His very presence, to see Him, to worship Him, to serve Him, to live with Him. Him. It'll be forever. Second Peter 3.13 This moment's coming. Are you and I ready? According to His promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Promise, because He's given us a promise, we're called to trust Him. We're called to wait. As we wait, we're called to be ready. We're to be fully right with God. We're going to be where righteousness dwells. God wants you and I to desire that right now, to just be right with God in all that we do. Heaven is God's promise. Heaven is God's promise. We will be with Him forever. 
Let it touch your life right now. Live for the glory of God right now. Be right in how you are before the Lord today. Be right in how you love others today. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all your soul, all your strength and all your might. And love your neighbor as yourself. That is directing your heart towards the Lord so that when we get to heaven one day, it'll be a natural next step to walk into his presence because we have cultivated already an affection for him. I want you, God wants me, to cultivate an affection for him, to be looking towards heaven right now, and to live today in light of that coming promise, to be faithful when it's hard, to be obedient to the end, to remain under the pressure when God is squeezing us, purging us, changing us, because it'll be worth it all one day when we're in his presence. Be encouraged by this truth so that you will live today by faith. I pray that's the strength of this promise in your life. Take this truth, this good news, and share it with people who need the Lord. They need the assurance and the certainty that one day they'll be with the Lord in heaven through relationship in Jesus Christ. Sins forgiven, provision made, relationship enabled. Because God has transformed the life of an individual. I pray that the joy of the Lord will be in your testimony every day because this is true. Thanks for joining with us today. Thanks for being with us. Revelation is touching our hearts. May it continue to touch your heart. We'll see you again next week.